Good morning, everybody. As we uh, continue our series in the book of James this morning, let me just begin by showing you a picture. This is a website, obviously. Does anybody know who the woman is that's pictured here? Uh, Marie Kondo? Yeah, obviously an easy question. Lots of people seem to know. Yeah, this is Marie Kondo. Uh, on her website, she has some biographical details, and as part of that, she says this, or the biography says this. Enchanted with organizing since her childhood, Marie began her tidying consultant business as a 19-year-old university student in Tokyo. Today, Marie is a renowned tidying expert helping people around the world to transform their cluttered homes into spaces of serenity and inspiration. I think my wife would say we clearly need some tidying experts at our place. Uh, but uh, Marie Kondo is actually part of a rapidly growing uh, business sector around the world, which is called the home organization industry. And it's a new thing, but it's a big thing. It's worth about... Uh, estimated $10 billion a year in the States in 2020. And Marie Kondo 2015 was named um, by Time Magazine one of the world's most influential people. So this is a, a big deal, getting uh, people to help you tidy up your home. And I don't know, I'm kind of old school. I wonder why people need that kind of thing. But actually, um, if you ask the question, why are we seeing the rise of this big industry now at this point in history, I'd say it's because we've got so much stuff. More than any other time in history, uh, we've got loads of things, and sometimes we get overwhelmed by the quantity of the goods that we own. A while back, I was doing a little bit of uh, reading into this topic, and I uh, picked up a book called The Empire of Things. It's a history of our material wealth, and its growth over the last 500 years. And uh, the author, as an example of the f what you might say the financial elite 500 years ago, uh, gives the example of Domenico Capello, who uh, died in 1532. And he was an aristocrat. He was the son of a Venetian admiral. He was part of the financial elite in Europe and one of the great trading centers of that time. And in the inventory of his belongings when he died, it listed 38 knives and 12 decorated spoons and forks and 42 plain forks among his many treasures. Now, he was part of the financial elite uh, in a time when most Europeans had never held a fork. So his, his wealth was immense. But I only need to open my cutlery drawer, and I can... I can confirm, I, I actually have more material wealth now than, uh, than a Venetian nobleman could aspire to 500 years ago. The, the amount of stuff we have is absolutely unique. Our material wealth is greater than it's ever been. And therefore, I think we need to pay careful attention to what James has for us as we come to chapter 5 of his book in verses 1 to 8, where he has... Some words for the rich. He also has some words uh, for the poor. But particularly this morning, I want us to think about the words that he has uh, to rich people, those who enjoy material wealth. Let's read through together uh, from verse 1. James says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl, for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. 
Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it, until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. James begins with some pretty stern words. You rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. He's warning the rich that they should fear the future. They should fear what's coming. Uh, But he's not talking about miseries that will come from economic depression or uh, a failed corporate strategy or some other vicissitude of the financial world. He's talking about miseries uh, in terms of the judgment of God. Very much in mind, he has God's judgment on rich people. Christians, as most of you will understand, believe that there's a coming day when God will judge the whole world by the one he's appointed, uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, this is very much part of James' thinking in these verses. We read in verse 3 about the last days. And he mentions the coming of the Lord uh, twice in verses 7 and 8. And in verse 5, he talks about a day of slaughter. And it's possible that that also is a reference to the coming last day of God's judgment. And James talks to the rich and says, you should fear that day and the coming judgment of God. What James says here is consistent with much of what we read in Scripture where we repeatedly have warnings about the dangers of wealth. Uh, For instance, Paul says, uh, those who desire uh, to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of of evil it's become proverbial in the english speaking world hasn't it and jesus also famously stated only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven again i tell you it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of god So James, with the rest of Scripture, wants to say the rich are in danger of ruin, of destruction, of exclusion from the kingdom of God. The rich will be judged. You might wonder, I wonder, well, what exactly is the problem with being wealthy? Well, James makes some uh, specific observations uh, about wealth. And we'll get to those, but first I just want to make some clarifying comments and say uh, that material abundance itself is not the problem. The good things that we enjoy in life and that bring us pleasure, they are not the problem in themselves. James, uh, at the beginning of his book, uh, in chapter 1, verse 17, he says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. And here James is referencing the world of creation. He says, we have a Father of the heavenly lights, God above. And just like the lights of heaven are regular, and they return again and again, our Father is faithful. And in the created world that he's made, it's full of good things, which he's given to us as a gift. Those good things that we enjoy are a gift from God, which should uh, be received with thanks. So the material abundance around us that that brings joy to our lives in many ways, that's not the problem. Uh, The problem uh, lies within. The problem uh, lies in our hearts. The reality is that there's a darkness there. there, uh, uh, We're so sinful that we're very prone to misuse the gifts of God to us. The issue is not external, it's internal. 
The issue is not money itself, but as Paul says, the love of money. Wealth has a tendency to bring out the worst in us, uh, to provoke what James calls that earthly wisdom of jealousy and uh, selfish ambition. And the impact of money on the human heart can be truly disturbing. You know, there's an abundance of experimental research that shows even thinking about money makes people more self-reliant and more selfish. So, uh, for instance, uh, psychologists have set, done lots of experiments like this where they set up a room and they prime people to think about money by maybe putting stacks of Monopoly money around the room or they put up computer screens with screensavers like this one with money dollar bills falling down or something like that. And if you do that to people, you prime them to think about money. Uh, for instance, if they're doing maths problems, they'll take twice as long to ask for help. If someone's been primed to think about money and an experimenter walks through the room and drops a pile of pencils, they'll be less likely to help pick them up. And if someone's been primed to think about money and they're told to set up some chairs for an interview, uh, they'll put the chairs further apart than they would otherwise. So in all sorts of ways, even just a subconscious uh, thought of money can drive us further away from other people and into a world of self-reliance and selfishness in quite disturbing ways. So I better take that picture down. In this passage, Jane talks about uh, five specific evils, five specific ways in which the rich do wrong, and for which the rich will be judged. In verses 2 and 3, James says, Your riches have rotted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Now, James speaks here about uh, laying up treasure, about people who are stacking up wealth. And there's so much of it, in fact, uh, there's a lot more than they can actually use. And so the riches are described as rotting. The clothes is full of moths. Money is corroding. Uh, it's being uh, stacked up. People needing to tear down their garages and build bigger ones and fill them up. In the words of James, I think there's a clear reference here to the teaching of Jesus himself. I think this is what James has in mind as he writes. Jesus' own teaching uh, is this. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And if the teaching of Jesus is a clue to James' intent here, then I would say the primary problem with this accumulation of wealth is that it becomes the place where you put your trust and your faith. And you're no longer looking to God uh, for your provision uh, and as uh, the greatest thing in life, but you begin to rely on the financial security that you can obtain for yourself through the many things that you own. And so James here says the rich will be judged putting your faith in your own financial security and your many possessions. In verse 4, James says this, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Those who accumulate wealth and stack it up they're not only sinning against God and showing a lack of reliance on God but they sin against others who could really do with the money who indeed deserve the money who are owed the money and James here points to a combination of of selfishness and and dishonesty and a lack of generosity and the reference here seems pretty clearly to be to Old Testament laws like uh, 
these words from the book of Deuteronomy, where God says to the Israelite people, you shall not oppress a hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he's one of your brothers or one of the sojourners who are in your land, within your towns. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. So James says to the rich, you'll be judged for withholding uh, your money and your generosity from those who need it and who indeed are owed it. In verse 5, James says, You've lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. Some people are driven by the anxieties and the worries of life to accumulate and to hoard their wealth up and to stow it away as a buffer against uh, the ups and downs of life. But there are others who are driven by the pleasures of life to waste their resources and just to splash out on, on their own pleasures and uh, use up those things which could have benefited other people. Uh, in saying this, James mirrors the cries of the Old Testament prophets. For instance, in these words from Amos, who says, Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils. Finally, in verse 6, James says, You've condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. The quest for personal gain can, it does, lead to harm, even to death, to those who, who are do, who've done nothing wrong, who are living upright lives. And James also brings this as an accusation against the rich. It's quite likely that this is part of the lived experience of the people that James is writing to. And you might remember uh, many weeks ago now, we read in chapter 2, uh, verse 6, James says, Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? And it may well be that this is the experience of some of the people that James is writing to, that they've suffered harm and loss at the hands of the rich. Uh, the Ten Commandments warn against greed, against covetousness, against what desire, uh, what be desiring what belongs to, to another. There it says, Do not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Because when you're greedy for the things that are your neighbor's, you need to watch out. Sin is crouching at your door. And those things which the Ten Commandments warn about, stealing and adultery and murder, dishonesty, those things are not far away if you allow greed to master you. So this is the accusation that James brings against the rich. And I have to say, personally, it makes me very uncomfortable. Because I am the rich. As we were discussing, we are a very wealthy society, and this is a pretty well-to-do kind of a church. I am the rich. And I can look at my own life and see ways in which I stack things up, in which I lack generosity and don't uh, give what I could to others. I can see ways in which I waste what I have on myself. I even have to acknowledge uh, that my part in the commercial system that we're a part of, you know, it, the consumerism that I contribute to, 
that plays its own part in the, in the death of environmental activists in the Amazon and, and Bangladeshi factory fires and all of that stuff. I am the rich. And so it can be pretty uncomfortable. I think we should be challenged by these verses and the, what James has to say. I also find this uncomfortable because to a degree we can feel a bit stuck, right? Okay, I'm rich. I do have all this stuff. Now what do I do? The reality is we're a wealthy society, uniquely wealthy. Uh, and, but to function in the mainstream of the society, you kind of have to be. You have to have computers and phones, cars, raincoats, sports equipment, all sorts of stuff. That's part of the world that we live in. So what are we going to do? There's a small percentage of people who take a radical option. You might join a monastic order or a Christian community that practices common ownership of goods, uh, such as the Bruderhof. Don't let uh, Gloria Vale necessarily put you off. I think the idea of Christian community in that way can work. And there are a small percentage of people who will take that, uh, take that road, and I've got a lot of respect for that. But for most of us, it's probably not feasible, and it may not even be the best choice for ourselves or our families or our communities uh, to do that. So what are we going to do as people who enjoy... Uh, an abundance of material goods. Well, interestingly, even in the time of the New Testament, uh, the churches contained rich people. Well, that's a relief. That's good. I can be rich and stay in church. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> uh, it seems to be the case, for instance, that the that the crowd that James is writing to is a is a mixed group. Uh, in chapter 1, he says, Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, thinking about his lifting up in Jesus, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. And so he's talking to both uh, those who are well off and those who are not, as he writes, uh, to Christians. So there... There, there are rich people who are part of the church, and thankfully the Bible does have practical and actionable advice for rich people. And James's focus is not to point us towards the positive, what we can do. So I don't really have the opportunity to spend a lot of time over this this morning, but in short, if you're wondering what to do, uh, the Bible teaches the best remedy for the love of money is found in gratitude and generosity. Gratitude and generosity. If you want to ensure that your heart is drawn in the right directions, you need to build practices and habits in your life of thankful prayer for what you have and regular sharing of your wealth freely and even sacrificially uh, with other people. As I say, we don't have a lot of time to spend on this. This morning, let's just look at one passage, though there are many others that we could profitably look at. Paul is talking to a young church leader, Timothy, and instructing him in how he, he should advise his church and talk to the people in his church. And Paul says this, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Here we see several things emphasized. One, the generosity of God. He gives us all things to enjoy, and that should excite our thankfulness. The material things we enjoy, they're good. Thank the Lord for them. We also find there the command to share, to be generous with what we've received with others. That's a command. And 
Paul says that when we do that, when we share what we have, we build up our investments in the right place. We're drawn to put our hearts in the right place and we'll experience an eternal abundance uh, when we do that. Did you notice it's, it's a set of verses addressed to the rich? Yeah, that's good. There is something I can do. I don't have to sit under the judgment of James, but I do need to listen to the teaching of Scripture about how I protect my heart from the many dangers which wealth brings. <coughs> Excuse me. I didn't want to come here this morning <coughs> and just offer a counsel of despair. So I hope you find that helpful. And uh, we have actually, within the movement of CCCNZ churches uh, here in New Zealand, and even in our own congregation here at Rally Street, we do have some outstanding examples of Christians who have sought to be God-honoring and generous uh, when they have enjoyed financial success. So Trinity Lands is a large-scale uh, farming operation. Its nerve center is in Patararu, just down the road. We've got representation on the governance uh, from within this congregation here. And uh, Litchfield Lands, or rather uh, Trinity Lands, uh, started in 1951 with the purchase of uh, some land to be farmed for charitable purposes uh, around Litchfield. And things have grown from there as, as different Christians have, have joined in and contributed. Uh, to the point that we've reached now. And Trinity Lands gives away 55% uh, of its profits each year, or that's the aim, uh, to charitable causes, to Christian work and to other things. And last year, uh, profits were $55 million, so that's $30 million going to charitable causes out of that Christian operation. Most of it to Christian ministry, a lot of it within the CCC and Z, NZ churches, but also are going to more general community operations like uh, free dental care and rescue helicopters and that kind of thing. So that's one example that we have a connection to. Famous historic example within our churches in New Zealand is Robert Laidlaw, who was the founder of Farmers Department Stores, and he was a lifelong participant in what were the Open Brethren Churches. Now we talk about CCCNZ. And Robert Laidlaw, on the 12th of February, uh, 1906, he was a 21-year-old salesman at that point, and he wrote a pledge in his diary saying, if the Lord blesses me with 2,000 pounds per annum, I'll give 25% of all I earn. Uh, in September 1910, age 25, his business was starting to really take off and boom, and he amended his pledge and he wrote in his diary at that point, I've decided to start now giving 50% of all my earnings. And he's someone who went on to have a great impact uh, in our family of churches and in New Zealand and globally, not only because of his financial giving, but because of his uh, spiritual uh, giving and his participation in our churches also. He's the founder of one of New Zealand's premier Bible colleges, now known as Laidlaw College. And in 1913, as still a young man at that stage, he wrote an explanation of the gospel for his employees, which was called The Reason Why, <coughs> and that subsequently became the most widely printed gospel tract in the world. It's still in print. Over 100 years later, there's an estimated 30 million copies that have been distributed worldwide. So we have some, some great inspirational examples from within our own movement and within even our own congregation uh, of, of people who have sought to use wealth not as a source of personal comfort but to benefit others. And if you're an aspiring business person here this morning or you've already experienced financial success, you're an entrepreneur, you're wired that way, then my goal this morning in bringing these words to you from James is not to drive you out of the church uh, but to encourage you to pledge yourself to use what you have for God and for the common good. Now, it's been my judgment that as a congregation, 
what we mostly need to hear is James's words to the rich. Uh, but I recognize not everybody is in that situation, and there are likely some people here who are experiencing financial hardship, and you think, that's actually not me. I'm struggling to put food on the table. I'm not wealthy. And James also does speak to the poor, and God has a great compassion for the poor. So it's been my judgment that I wanted to focus on the rich. We won't spend a lot of time on this, uh, but I do want to spend a few minutes looking at what James says in verses 7 and 8. It doesn't explicitly say that this is a word for the poor, but it's certainly a word for those who have been oppressed or ripped off, people who have suffered injustice, who have been on the wrong end of their dealings with the rich. And James says in verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. So his attention here switches from the rich, who he's been addressing to his Christian brothers and sisters, and he says, Be patient. Justice will be served. You will have your recompense. Jesus is coming. Be patient. I want to be clear in relaying these words to you that patience is not the same thing as passivity. Patience is not the same thing as resignation or acceptance. Uh, James isn't asking the poor to just shrug their shoulders, say it is what it is. That's not patience. Christians uh, desire to see economic justice done. Christians should strive uh, for economic justice. And when James asks for patience, he's not saying just accept the situation. But the emphasis here is that injustice shouldn't give way to sin, to vengeance, to violence, to bitterness, to anger, in other words, he's just pointing out that the earthly wisdom of jealousy and selfish ambition, that can grow in a soil of poverty just as it can in a soil of riches. And a love of money can be stimulated by the lack of it. And James doesn't want to see people twisted up by poverty into something ugly. Be patient. Take solace from the reality that, as it says in Romans 12, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And in the meantime, we seek to overcome evil with good. Let's just stop and pray there um, for a minute. Father, this is a topic that affects all of us in different ways. I myself recognize I've received much blessing from you, many good things. And with others here, I want to give you thanks for the many blessings we enjoy, even just the cutlery drawer. Our lives are filled with abundance. We thank you for that. Father, for those also who are here struggling financially, these verses touch them as well. We thank you that Jesus is coming. We thank you that justice will be done. We thank you that there will be uh, a recompense and that the poor will inherit the earth. And we look forward to that day. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Now, in finishing, we look ahead to our time of communion this morning. And so I want to just finish by reminding us that uh, whether we're rich or poor here this morning, Jesus is both our Savior and the paradigm by which we all live. Second yeah. Corinthians 8 and 9 says, You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, 
so that by his poverty he could make you rich. In the riches of his divine nature, Jesus was generous. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, giving up his very life for you and for me. And we praise the Lord for the salvation that we enjoy through the generosity of Jesus Christ, the one who was rich. Now, Jesus was poor, and in the poverty of his human existence, we read that he was patient. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And we want to praise God for what Jesus went through and what he put up with and what he suffered at the hands of lawless and unrighteous people without retaliating, without taking vengeance, without sin in order to offer his life as a perfect, unblemished sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus is our saviour and he's our exemplar. And as we come to communion this morning, I'll ask Richard to come up and pray and give thanks for the emblems that we have. But let's think about uh, what Jesus Christ has done to, for us in riches and in poverty. Thank you.